all over the world uh, and uh, wherever uh, such an occasion occurs, since PGA has got representatives either in the country or in the region, uh, we are almost uh, becoming uh, the first responders in some ways, uh, as far as parliaments uh, of the world are concerned. And uh, we do uh, uh, really look forward to working closely uh, with the, the group of ambassadors who uh, feel the same way as uh, the PGA members do uh, in terms of uh, following uh, uh, the human rights agenda. And it uh, goes across uh, a number of uh, different areas as by now you're very uh, familiar with, uh, starting with the uh, campaign for International Criminal Court and uh, bringing uh, those, sorry, uh, bringing those uh, who feel that they can commit any kind of atrocity uh, in their own country, and, and there's nobody there who can challenge them. Um, but now with the ICC in place, uh, a lot of people would uh, genuinely be fearful uh, that if it's been spread out too far out, then nobody uh, really is immune and uh, can be uh, hauled in for these things. Uh, other than that, the whole uh, concept of uh, international peace and security, the uh, control of arms, uh, uh, from the small arms and light weapons all the way uh, to the major arms uh, 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 proliferation, as, uh, as well as now the automated weapons uh, around the world, biological and chemical weapons. So it, it's, it's a, a very wide array of things that uh, PG. Uh, is concerning itself with, uh, and wherever the UN uh, needs for things to be rectified in country, uh, PGA always steps up to the plate uh, and tries to uh, uh, help uh, bring countries on board, get them uh, to sign, get them to ratify, and get them to legislate uh, to implement these things. Um, uh, on a parallel note, of course, uh, the rights of individuals, um, uh, gender equality, uh, and uh, uh, the rights of uh, LGBT people uh, and marginalized groups within uh, uh, countries, uh, which have uh, historically through years of uh, misguided, I would say, uh, principles uh, have been legislated against. And it is time that we start reversing all those. And there again, since country uh, legislation is more important, uh, it is uh, uh, important that we all work together to get to this point. I don't think I'll digress more because we've got some experts uh, here, uh, but uh, uh, as long as we know that we are on the same page and working towards the same goal. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And this takes us um, immediately to our to our uh, first uh, first cluster. And uh, that maybe is uh, concerning the next, uh, the next years in the in the in the work of the United Nations, as you probably know, um, uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres was just elected this morning for a second uh, term. So this is a, it's a big and uh, historic uh, day, and one of his uh, big uh, projects uh, ahead is the, the common agenda. Um, and it's my uh, great pleasure to give the floor um, on this to, uh, to Walter Turk, the Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Cooperation uh, from the uh, Executive Office. Uh, Walter, it's uh, wonderful to see you. We saw each other briefly in the in the plenary this morning and uh, the floor is yours. I'm not seeing you yet on the screen, but I'm sure you're there. So, Walter. Hi. Or no, yeah. I see. I think we are we are doing so well that we are one minute. Oh, he, he joined us at, oh. the, at twenty-four because we were told to be exactly on time. Oh, I see. Okay. And now it's uh, it's really that we are really breaking the the oh. minute. Okay. And, uh, Dr. Volker too just joined us. So uh, okay. Christian. Good morning, uh, Volker. We're, we're doing something that is uh, very very unusual at the UN. We are ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good morning to all of you. I was just uh, saying that it was a great pleasure to to see you in the hall on the uh, on the occasion of the, the election to the SG for a second term, a very uh, solemn, big, uh, historic uh, day. And uh, of course, I did introduce you 
um, and uh, and announced that he would be uh, speaking uh, to us about the, the common agenda. We are very much uh, look forward to your presentation. It's wonderful to have you here. Thanks for taking the time. Volker, over to you. No, thank you very much, um, uh, Christian. D sorry, I, did I get it? Do you want to st me to start or did I hear that correctly? Yes, please. Floor ah, is yours. Great. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a, really a great opportunity on such a wonderful day where we have the Secretary General reappointed for, for his second term. So it's, it's really fantastic for all of us and, and to have also this engagement precisely on an issue that really points to the future. And I think it's it's fantastic that there is this engagement with with parliamentarians uh, across the world and and I mean for us of course from the UN's perspective uh, parliamentarians are really at this crossroads of the local and and the global and I think we we see this interconnectivity really play out in parliaments in particular and and the awareness, of course, among parliamentarians of, of the global dimension in, a, in everything that, that you do. And uh, I just wanted to share a couple of reflections with yourselves, which, which also go a little bit to certainly the second term of the Secretary General, but also in particular the Common Agenda report that the Secretary General has to produce by September about present and future challenges. And let me come back to, to the role of parliaments and this this combination between the local and the global, um, because I think what we have lived through in the pandemic, and unfortunately now everything, whenever we talk about anything these days, we start with the pandemic, but I think if, if one looks at it more concretely, it's absolutely clear that the pandemic has in a way um, shown two things. First of all, the it has made the interconnectedness between everything that we do so much clearer uh, and, and, you know, especially uh, that whatever problem that we have today, whatever challenge that we have today, whatever issue that we deal with has obviously global implications. There's not one single issue or hardly a, an issue that doesn't have somewhat a transboundary nature. That's the first. The second is the shared vulnerability. Um, I think in the global north, I think populations probably felt less vulnerable uh, in the past because of the economic, the social economic developments and so forth. But what this pandemic has, and of course in the global south, I mean, you know, vulnerabilities, fragilities are, are the norm. And, 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 they, and people in, in the global south in many countries, especially in fragile countries, but also countries in conflict, they, they almost, speak, it's a survival method to, to live with, with big risks and, and with pandemics. But, um, in a way, what this pandemic has done, it has actually shown a shared vulnerability uh, a, across the world, which again is a strong connectivity, connectivity factor. And I think the realization that we are all in it together is, is one that hopefully will also um, be a, something that we, we learn from, from, from this pandemic. And when you look at big changes in multilateralism, you will always see that a crisis was always the one that almost triggers a big change. I mean, after the Second World War, uh, with the institutions that were founded with the Charter, it was obviously after all that happened during the, the Second World War, which actually triggered precisely this realization that international cooperation, global issues need to be dealt with in a, in a fundamentally different way. And I, I think we have certainly seen over the last couple of years this paradox that when we actually need more international cooperation, it has been much more difficult to achieve it. And somewhat we hope that the pandemic and the realization of this interconnectivity of the shared vulnerability will actually trigger, uh, hopefully, uh, a new momentum of coming together. And, and that's where the UN 75 declaration comes in. The UN 75 declaration was drafted at a time when the geopolitics of this world were still much more difficult. I think we are seeing some 
uh, more interesting uh, developments uh, these days, albeit not entirely uh, satisfying because the geopolitical divides are still there and some of the geostrategic issues are, uh, haven't really changed. But the UN 75 declaration nonetheless brought all member states together to essentially recommit in 12 very crucial areas starting with leaving no one behind. So there is a strong orientation, people orientation, which is extremely important. It validated the existing roadmaps, the Charter, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Human Rights Frameworks, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and it triggered a, a very profound reflection process uh, within certainly the UN, but we have, as you, as you know, we have involved uh, thought leaders around the world, some 40 or so. We, we have involved young people, the next generation fellows, uh, who were working in 40 countries with youth groups, really thinking through what they themselves want to envision for, for their own, you know, what, how do they envision the world for themselves. It has also triggered with civil society, uh, with different parts of the private sector, this type of reflection as well as among member states. Um, we had very interesting informal breakfast meetings covering all 12 themes. And it was interesting to hear back what type of, you know, what are the emotions, what are the, the thoughts out there that, that would trigger this new momentum that I've been talking about, that actually we, we, real, we, we need to make multilateralism so much more effective. And one thing, and I think that speaks very much also to, to the work of parliamentarians. One thing that has come out very clearly is this need for a reimagined social contract. I think in many countries around the world, we see that there is a bit of a disconnect between popula populations and people and institutions that are supposed to serve them. And, and that disconnect ends up in mistrust. It ends up sometimes in populist politics. It ends up in authoritarian tendencies in, in human rights violations, of course, as well, unfortunately. And, and this social contract, and even to think about what social contract means today, not just for populations that are there, but also for future generations, is, is certainly one of the themes that will be very strong in the, uh, in the, in the common agenda report that the SG will put forward. And it's circ it revolves around these you know, big themes of trust. How do we build trust? How do we build equality? How do we make sure that there is consultation and participation? How do we make sure that there is really visibility of, uh, of populations? Uh, leaving no one behind, as you know, was really the mantra to ensure that those who are disadvantaged, who are at risk, that we actually make it visible what their needs are and their aspirations are. And, and this trust issue, and I, I know that probably in the in parliamentary side, that's one where you are almost sort of the connector between the populations and... and uh, uh, sorry, I hear someone speak. Somebody, uh, somebody is unfortunately... Uh, is it okay? Okay. Yeah, no, it's please, fine. Um, please mute. So, they, so on the whole social contract side, we hope to put forward some, some ideas, including, you know, uh, what are the longer term implications of decisions we take today? And that really goes to future generations. So I, I think we have often wondered what type of role parliaments can play when we look at decisions that are taken today and what the impact of it is on future generations. And I know that there are different practices in, in different countries where you would have for instance, an exercise of strategic foresight, you know, envisioning the world in 20, 30, 40 years down the line, how would it look like? What type of choices do we have to make as a result? And, and I think it would be also interesting to do that at the, at the global, at the multilateral level. And um, this strategic foresight is certainly an aspect that from the perspective of, of the UN is extremely important because we sit on an incredibly rich data set and you know, we also know that when it comes to governance, very often there is this tension between short-term electoral cycles, which require a certain attitude, but which are not necessarily longer term. And the UN, 
that that has this long-term view that is obligated to present this long-term view that is presented this analysis and how do we bridge this in a much better way and how does it then land on the governance side and uh, I think we have seen a number of parliaments have actually done some future literacy you know looking at at what the future holds if certain decisions are, are taken or not taken and, and what this means as a result and then so this whole social contract issue is is one that as you know the secretary general in particular has been talking about especially in a speech that he gave last year uh, for the Nelson Mandela um, anniversary um, but it also links with the multilateral side um, because if we you know whenever we analyze countries in conflict whenever we analyze countries that face serious human rights issues we always come back to essentially a fragmented or even a broken social contract so this social contract there is something in it that that really needs some some further thought um, and it is linked to then the multilateral side and and there I think what we have seen including some early lessons learned from the pandemic show clearly the way that we need more inclusivity I mean the vaccine issue just to give you the, the most prominent example uh, we, obviously you need the industry you need the pharmaceutical you need the research side you need the science side to come in and the it was a miracle that they managed to develop a, a vaccine within a year, which frankly in the past probably would have taken a decade at least. Um, but that side needs to work with the logistic, but with the manufacturing capabilities, with, with the international financial institution, and of course, most importantly, with member states who have the, the power to, to make the difference precisely to, to do what what makes so eminent sense to make sure that vaccines are distributed quickly everywhere and to everyone within a very short period of time. And that really then questions, do we have a system in place today that actually ensures that multilateralism is effective with teeth, as the Secretary General often says, networked and inclusive. And that's really one of the big areas of debate that we have uh, within the common agenda and we hope to really put forward some interesting ideas to to the member states um, and to societies at large on you know for instance how do we rethink what global public goods mean and what type of governance are appropriate for them so that we learn the lessons from the pandemic but we also really look forward to um and a you know a more stronger preparedness and prevention agenda that that is going to be so necessary as we as we move forward when we see all the challenges that we face triple planetary crisis climate action and so forth so i think this gives you a very quick rundown of where we are uh, on all of these issues and um yeah would be very keen and interested in hearing from you over to you thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Volker. Terrific. Um, over to um, over to uh, our participants, please. Um, I think we'll do it sort of the old-fashioned way. So please raise your please raise your hand, um, uh, and we will give you uh, we will give you the floor. And obviously, go on camera if you're not already. So floor is open. Petra, Petra, bye. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hello, Volker, very good to see you. Um, greetings from Vienna. Um, two, two thoughts after what you, what you said. Uh, first of all, I know that the goal 17 of the SDG is the one that should foster cooperation between countries is always under revision or under, uh, under supervision at the HLPF um, in New York. Every year it's, on, it's one of the priorities, but at the same time, it's maybe one of the, of the least uh, concrete, of the least really easy to follow. And I, I have the opinion when you talk about that it's important to have better cooperation between countries now, um, that we quite clearly see that we really failed that at the moment as well and that's also connected to my second thought um, you talked about the learnings of, of the pandemic and um, especially the vaccine issue 
when we see that there is a very dense multilateral um, construct and, and, and legal, legal construction to how to protect um, benefits of, or, or profits of, of shareholders of, of, of industry, of those who produce uh, vaccination medicine in, in general, or those who own the intellectual property rights. In the same time, we see that there were billions of, of euros and dollars going from, from public money into the industri into industry, into research, into science, and that money made it possible to find a vaccination so quickly, totally right. Yeah, Without that public money, it wouldn't be possible. But the very dense protection of international inter intellectual property rights, for instance, hinder us um, to have a, a TRIPS waiver, to, to waive um, intellectual property rights and, and make it possible to produce vaccination, for instance, everywhere where it is needed and everywhere where is the potential to and that are lots of countries, yeah, not just the global north, of course. Um, so how do you think we can multilateral multilateralism in itself can better balance between hard interests of profits and obviously soft interest of, of health or human rights in the end. Um, I think there is a disbalance in these two values. Thank you, Petra. Very pertinent question. Um, David? Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And, uh, and we are very grateful uh, on behalf of PGA to the Assistant Secretary General for the time that he's giving to us. And I also wanted to thank um, the executive office of the Secretary General for having involved Parliamentarians for Global Action in a consultation that saw some of our board members, uh, the protagonists, including um, Navid Kamar and uh, uh, Margareta Sederfeld and all the, the leadership of PGA. We produced a paper um, that we included in the consultation on our common agenda, which a little bit tries to go back to the ABC on international peace and security. And unfortunately, what the United Nations uh, member states have been unable to implement in 75 years, which, is, which has led, unfortunately, to the tragic situations as, for example, the one that we witnessed in Syria, definitely the worst armed conflict um, of the last 20 years and certainly a preventable one. As, as we have uh, together with us a, a very special guest for the next section, I want to recognize in general Romeo Dallaire, a former senator from Canada, who taught to all of us that genocide in Rwanda was preventable, as then also certified by the African Union, by the UN, by NGOs, by experts. But he was the first on the ground to tell to the world, we can prevent this. And we really failed uh, at that point in time when he alerted the international community. So I think, um, what uh, I would like to bring your attention to, and of course it's for the entire executive office and, and uh, Secretary General Guterres, is to try to find a way to bring back international law at the center of the mandate of the Secretary General, when possible as the individual organ who is the guardian of the legality under the UN Charter, be able to alert, of course the Council, but also the, the General Assembly, that it has a, a, a subsidiary or a residual responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security to do something because we cannot accept another Syria or another Rwanda. So I just want to put this heavy weight on the table because I think we discussed it in PJ for several months. And um, I know it's a very, very difficult task, but we need to be forward looking towards the 100th anniversary of the UN Charter and we want to get ready to, to, to perform all together better in that, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Incidentally, I just made the best pitch possible for our Myanmar General Assembly resolution this afternoon. So I very, Thank very you. strongly um, agree with you. And uh, as you know, um, we're very, very like-minded as far as putting the rule of law and the international, um, international law at the center of the, of the UN for us, that, that this is what the UN uh, really encapsulates more than more than uh, than anything else, and what it derives its uh, its unique legitimacy from. Um, the floor is open. Uh, of course, who else would like to um, make a comment or address a question to the uh, to the Assistant Secretary General? Um,
please just uh, raise your hand or you can actually just uh, unmute and, uh, and speak and maybe quickly uh, introduce yourself. Floor is open. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Boris Dietrich. I'm a senator from the Netherlands. Uh, Mr. Rettuk, good afternoon from the Netherlands. I would like to ask a question about uh, trust and the social contract you were talking about, because I think it's two very, very important issues. Um, I think that we as members of parliament have to play a role in a role model actually in terms of gaining trust from the public. But that also goes for the United Nations. And for instance, it's always an ongoing discussion when we talk about the Human Rights Council, that there are member states um, who joined the uh, Human Rights Council, but they are violating human rights in a terrible way. And um, people become quite skeptical when they see that those violators are part of the Human Rights Council. So could you elaborate on the role of the UN in gaining trust uh, and in uh, the concept of um, a social contract? Thank you. Thank you. Um... Maybe I can interject a quick comment um, on that as a member, as a member state. Um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing Volker's uh, comments on that. Of course, the point you're raising is, um, is a critical point for, for many people. What we have done as, uh, as a state that, that elects uh, and has a, you know, has a vote, we have, um, we have insisted on a, a number of benchmarks that states should meet. Uh, if they are elected to the to, to the Human Rights Council, and we've always also encouraged uh, to have competitive slates in in all regional groups, including our own, so people have a real choice. Um, we, as as Liechtenstein, have often uh, exercised uh, our right our, our right to abstain uh, if a clean slate was offered to us, and we were not satisfied with uh, the choice that we were given, um, and. Um, that is unfortunately not something that many of our colleagues um, do, but this is how we look at it from a, from a, from a state perspective. This is what we believe uh, we can do because the, the Human Rights Council, uh, you know, the founding resolution of the Human Rights Council indeed established certain benchmarks that in our view, all, all council members should be, should be to uh, meet. Um, we have another question. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I think along uh, the same lines, uh, we as uh, members of parliaments are all politicians, and we know that uh, at the end of the day, all politics is local. Uh, same seems uh, to be the case, obviously, at uh, uh, transnational level, and uh, even within the United Nations, uh, we come down to uh, voting or uh, uh, moving uh, resolutions uh, uh, on issues that would be uh, get us the support back home. Each country uh, works on that. Given that perspective, uh, how are we going to move forward on the very issue that we started out uh, discussing, uh, which is that of the vaccination? Because obviously countries are taking positions depending on where they are uh, in, in this whole international uh, uh, spectrum. So uh, I would like to hear your comments on it. And is there a future for a global policy or no? Thank you so much. Maybe we have take one more and go back to you, uh, Volker, and then I guess we have to stick to our uh, schedule. Rodrigo, did you want to speak? Um, Rodrigo, my colleague from Costa Rica, I thought you were unmuted at some point. Um, now maybe I was, uh, I was mistaken. Anybody else? Um, Perhaps. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much um, for hosting us this morning. Yeah, my name is Kasturi Patu. I'm a member of parliament from Malaysia and a board member in the PGA. Um, I'd just like to take pick up on a point by my colleague Boris as well, um, which is on accountability. Uh, how do we hold countries that aim to be in the Human Rights Council or who are in the Human Rights Council who are committing violations and aggressions against human rights 
uh, in their own countries. And, um, and because Malaysia is one of the countries that's vying to be on the Human Rights Council, uh, one pertinent issue I also would like to raise would be on the crisis of refugees. Um, I think in a time of a pandemic and more countries are building walls instead of building bridges, you find that there is more um, uh, a, a pushback against policies on refugees. And it's affecting every single country that's on the receiving end of refugees, whether it is because of the pandemic or pre-existing reasons why they had to leave their, their countries. And I don't know how far the UN has been speaking about refugee crisis, whether it's in Southeast Asia, particularly the Rohingyas, whether it is about uh, the Tamils uh, from Sri Lanka, whether it is about the Uyghurs, whether it's about the Papuans, whether it's about the Patanis from uh, the south of Thailand, um, I, and also in the other parts of the Middle East, um, making their way into Europe. Um, so I think this is something that for me and my fellow colleagues would be important to speak about at this point and the excess of vaccination for refugees and those who have been displaced. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, we have two more requests, in fact, uh, so we'll take both of those and then uh, we go back to uh, to our guests. So Mark, uh, Mark uh, Richard, first, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Assistant Secretary General. And I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted that Antonio has been uh, re-elected re for a second term and uh, he's been doing a fantastic job and obviously other parts of the UN as well. And uh, uh, on his watch, of course, the World Food Programme under David Beasley uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize, which is uh, unprecedented and absolutely amazing. And thank you for the UN's continued support of parliamentarians global action. Um, it, it is a, a, a partnership uh, and I'm delighted that um, uh, David continues uh, to lead us as Secretary General. Um, if I may, uh, my particular interest is in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and all things sub-Saharan Africa, but specifically for this conversation, um, I chair the caucus in the UK Parliament um, on the abolition of the death penalty. And uh, uh, there are many countries that basically have a moratorium. Uh, PGA is working with many to try and get legislation on the statute uh, books to try and get full abolition. But I, I just wonder where that, where that sort of issue is i know it's not sort of top priority but what more do you think the un can do to encourage member states and work alongside pga in in turning moratoriums into abolition uh, and we've had some success but clearly we need more thank you thank you so much and our last uh, intervention is from uh, rosaina adam from the maldives Pleasure to have you, please. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. It's so nice to see you all here. And uh, first of all, my congratulations to the Secretary General for getting re-elected. And also to all of you for electing our uh, foreign minister as the next president of the UN General Assembly. Uh, while we are on the topic of vaccines, what I wanted to clear was, um, we're talking about leaving no one behind, but at the same time, we're seeing that there are a lot of countries that are not receiving the vaccines, and it is uh, critical to get vaccines at this point for all countries uh, to get life back to normal. So uh, what is the role that uh, UN is uh, playing right now in ensuring that all countries are uh, getting vaccines as soon as possible? And also uh, another thing that we're hearing is that uh, to travel to some countries, you need a particular vaccine. So uh, this is also, I think, uh, something that the UN should be discussing and uh, it would be great to have a common uh, focus here so that it's not just some particular vaccine, but all vaccines that the UN approves uh, uh, are accepted throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, an another very pertinent question on the on the pandemic. And um, back to you, Volker. I think you have a pretty uh, rich uh, set of, of questions on a wide range of topics. So uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Christian, and also to, to all the colleagues who 
who have engaged on, on, on all of these very issues. I mean, Liebe Petra, herzliche Grüße nach Wien aus New York. Um, I think it's, it's interesting what you say, because, you know, we, when we looked at the UN 75 declaration, but also at, at the current landscape of multilateralism, there, we are thinking of it, it's in, I don't know if you saw the book by Jeremy Hyman's about old power and new power. I mean, the old power has its legitimacy, obviously has to do its job, but we also know that old power structures and institutional arrangements are often, how should I say, not necessarily the most nimble for change. They are not necessarily the ones that are easily adaptable. This being said, I mean, we have also seen that the UN, I mean, if you look at some of the things 75 years ago to now, there have been amazing changes. So there has been a repurposing even of, of if you like, old power structures. But it's still, we know that a big, big bang type institutional reform would be extremely unrealistic. Uh, I mean, we need to be, you know, we are, there has been an ongoing discussion about Security Council reform. I mean, uh, I don't think anyone expects this to happen tomorrow. Um, but what we have seen at the same time is new powers. And we have seen, you know, if one isn't creative and flexible enough, if you are not engaging with partners across the world and emerging new partners all the time, uh, you are not going to be able to do much in by way of a solution. And so, so what we are trying to ch achieve in, in the writing up of the Common Agenda Report is precisely how do we capture networks, new emerging networks? How do we, what type of energy do we see in them? Uh, how do we ensure that we are able as the UN to include them in our own deliberations? how we are able to link them up and to tie them up in, in, in whatever we are trying to do. And that's why I think also this engagement is, is so crucial and so important. And in a way it leads then precisely, I mean, just to give you one example, when there was a very critical moment in 2019, when we were really extremely worried about where we are going on climate. And you know, coal uh, power, I mean, coal industry was flourishing and blossoming. And then we also saw that the young people across the world, I mean, Greta Thunberg is one, but I mean, you had many others. There were all these demonstrate the Friday demonstrations. And so there was an energy out there among people to really demand change, especially young people. So the SG then called for a climate summit with youth ahead of the Climate Action Summit that he convened on, on, on climate, which by the way, was not the formal process. The formal process was the COPs and the UNFCCC and all of this. So in a way, we, we found a formula that, that couldn't be disputed where you basically convene young people, where we had a number of heads of state, heads of government, uh, including by the way, the Austrian president, um, we had uh, and, the, and the SG as a key listener, not as a keynote speaker, but as a key listener to the demands of young people. And I mean, I'm not saying it changed immediately everything, but we have seen over the last two years quite remarkable changes that frankly, even a couple of months ago, we, were, we, we thought would be very difficult to achieve in terms of commitments to CO2 reductions. Uh, over by 2050. And so that gives us hope that by linking up, by being creative, by being innovative and, and finding very quickly evolving partnerships that we can actually push for the, if you like, an agenda that, that, that ensures the survival of, of humanity and the planet. So, so SDG 17 is a tool which has to be always, a, has to be one that is evolving constantly and that is almost organically driven and, and incremental. Um, on the, on, on the, and of course, what you said about profits, the, this whole issue of equity and solidarity is going to be a very important part of, of the Common Agenda Report. And there will be a number of reflections uh, there. Um, I think David, uh, very interesting uh, on, I mean, for us, it's clear, by the way, the, S, the Secretary General deals with the Security Council 
on a monthly basis uh, in terms of basically doing precisely the horizon scanning and putting on the agenda. I mean, he suggests, because of course it's the Security Council that decides, but he suggests and discusses situations that arise. And, and these are very open and frank discussions in an informal setting. And sometimes that is more helpful than formal settings, precisely to inform their own reflections. Uh, the same with the GA, and I, I mean, Christian, uh, I mean, bravo to you for having led this, because I think it will be very important to have a GA General Assembly resolution on Myanmar come out that has a unified position in relation to the developments there, because it will help all of us, and it will help also the ones who, who, who you know, are trying to make sure that democracy survives. Uh, uh, and is that this is just a temporary setback, but as you all know, and knowing Myanmar quite well, um, this is going to be a very tough road. Uh, but it's definitely it's it's very important that the GA comes through in a in a unified way on this, because that's we're also talking to the special envoy Christine. I mean, it's clear that we need we need precisely that message from the international community, and the unified position is absolutely critical. Boris on the social contract. Um, Actually, if you look at uh, trust barometers, the Edelman and others, the UN comes across as, as an institution that still has a lot of trust benefits. In I, mean, I mean, we have seen this actually higher than, than, than states, uh, than, than governments, which, which is an important one, but we need to earn it every day. And I think there is there are different UNs and and uh, I mean obviously when we we are engaged in humanitarian activities um, or in in delivering life saving assistance, uh, you know we are a household. The UN is a household name. I used to work for thirty years for for the UN, UN High Commissioner for Refugees. I mean we were a household name in the most remote parts of of countries that were affected by by crisis by conflict. Um, more than, frankly, in the developed world, but that's also where our, the bulk of our work is. Um, and I think we need to walk the talk when it comes to our own operational engage, engagement, which means when we have and design programs of assistance and protection, we need to involve the people that are affected by it. It's, it's a little bit coming out of the disability movement, you know, nothing uh, nothing about us without us. That's actually the same type of approach that we have to have whenever we do activities with people and for people. This sort of strong age gender diversity dimension, which is so crucial for a social contract. What you mentioned about the Human Rights Council, and I'm glad that Christian uh, answered it, and it's obviously a state, uh, a state decision or a member state decision, but it's also clear that the Human Rights Council needs to have the legitimacy and the, uh, and the, uh, of electing countries that are trying very hard to improve their human rights record. And there were pledges made uh, in, in, in a number of issues. And I hope that we really can see this as a, as a, as a process that, you know, make sure that these pledges that governments make before they want to be elected, that that's taken seriously. I, I remember a number of countries, I won't name them here, obviously, who made all kinds of pledges in order to get elected, but none of them were, were fulfilled. So there needs to be some way of, of public debate around pledges that, that countries make. But I fully agree with you. It's, it's an issue that affects the UN as a whole if, if countries with very serious human rights violations are actually elected. But let's not forget, human rights is not a ping pong game politically, but it's, it's, a, it's a discussion to advance uh, the indivisibility of economic, social, cultural, civil and political ones, and at least have a really serious conversation about how we, how we can advance that agenda. Um, on the vaccine, because I got it, I think Rosina uh, as well, uh, and, and the colleague, I think I can't remember who it was, I think from Pakistan, if I'm, um, if I'm correct. We actually have a system that, that was created. It's the ACT Accelerator. Uh, and the COVAX facility. So there is a system that was a multi-stakeholder system that was developed with Gavi Alliance, with the WHO, with industry. Frankly, one of the big issues that we had was, was the funding. It came very late. Uh, we have, in the meantime, you probably saw the IMF study coming out that if only 
that could be financed, it would be the best um, socio-economic recovery plan. It's the most sensible uh, economic policy that one could even imagine. Unfortunately, you know, even the G7 outcome, frankly, was disappointing on that front because we had hoped for much more. We had hoped that we would be able to have uh, the funding available for 8 billion, 9 billion vaccines because we need, we know that the world needs to be vaccinated, uh, not just to ensure that we save lives, but also for making sure that we emerge from this pandemic. And somehow that message, and the, 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 the Secretary General has been absolutely clear about it, we have the facilities, he has called for a global action plan. There, I, I think that's one of the lessons learned. We probably really need more effective multilateralism with peace when it comes to these big issues of existential threats. Uh, and, and hopefully there will be a serious consideration given to it in the future because we will have other threats as well and we need to find a way to, to address them. And, and also to our colleague from the Maldives, uh, yes, congratulations on, on the, on the uh, appointment of your foreign minister as the new president of the General Assembly. Malaysia, on, I mean, the colleague from Malaysia, I mean, by the way, I served in Malaysia for four years, so I, I know certainly the refugee situation in Malaysia extremely well, but also globally, of course, given my previous function. Um, there is actually a big success story that probably we need to find better ways to communicate about it. There is a global compact on refugees that was adopted uh, three years ago or two and a half years ago. Um, and it's, it is a precisely about responsibility sharing, making sure that human rights of refugees are respected, that, that people are accepted because they can't go back to their home countries. But at the same time that host countries are supported, host countries that receive large numbers of refugees in particular, and you probably saw today, uh, UNHCR published its latest statistics with, with over 80 million people forcibly displaced, most of them internally, but there is over 15 million or so refugees. And uh, let's also not forget most countries, um, I, I mean, if you look at those receiving the most uh, refugees, it's of course Turkey, uh, number one on, on Syrians, but it's also Lebanon, Jordan, it's Colombia it, for the Venezuelans, it's, uh, it's of course Uganda, uh, for South Sudanese. And most refugees are actually in countries, uh, in middle income countries or higher middle income countries or, or developing world, um, including Malaysia. You, you have been very uh, good at receiving Rohingya refugees. But we also had, I mean, I remember I had very robust discussions with the government about, uh, about how to ensure that we can protect and assist them. But it's definitely a big issue. But there is a global blueprint of action that supports host countries that are particularly affected. And that's in this global compact on refugees that I mentioned. It's about responsibility and burden sharing, if you like. Uh, and that has actually produced even a lot of resources. I mean, the World Bank... Um, for provided in, in its international development assistance, which they have never done before, 4 billion for host countries that are particularly affected so that refugees can be received, that they find safety and protection. And on uh, the death penalty, you know, there's an annual report uh, that the secretary, actually the secretary reflects it in a number of reports. And, you know, the position of the of the UN Secretariat is very clear. I mean, we have a very clear position against the death penalty and we want to ensure that it's unequivocally abolished. Um, member states have a more nuanced position. I mean, there is a strong call for it, but there is a General Assembly which was not adopted by consent, a General Assembly resolution, which was, unfortunately wasn't adopted by consensus and some countries that, that are still uh, applying it point this out to us in no uncertain terms, but we are not giving up on that and it's a very important issue. I think I have probably covered, I hope, all the questions that you had and all the comments and again, very big thanks to you for, for this engagement and for, for inviting me, uh, Christian. Terrific. Well, many, many thanks from us, uh, Volker, and thank you for, for going uh, very deep into 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 your very impressive uh, trove of, uh, of knowledge on, on all kinds of issues, and uh, thanks for taking uh, time uh, 
to be with us. So good, good to see you, Volker. Uh, we're a bit uh, behind schedule now, and we move immediately to our uh, to our next panel. Bye, bye, Volker. Um, that is a topic particularly dear to to the heart of certainly many in this call and and, and my own. That's uh, atrocity prevention, something that has um, has been uh, keeping the UN uh, occupied for a long number of years, and something that in fact. Uh, you know, uh, also has made up some of the worst blemishes in the history of the UN, uh, be it, uh, you know, in Srebrenica or be it in, um, in uh, Rwanda. Um, there has been a, a lot of activity, of course, a lot of initiatives um, concerning, um, concerning um, atrocity prevention. Uh, we will be hearing uh, on the responsibility uh, to protect a principle uh, in a in a minute, on the, from the state perspective, we have led on the uh, on the drafting of a code of conduct uh, on atrocity prevention for states that serve uh, on the Security Council. The Act Code of Conduct that has been uh, uh, endorsed by 122 uh, member states, uh, which is a good uh, good number, but we need more higher numbers and we need uh, more implementation of that. Um, but with this. Uh, quick intro. Uh, it is a great uh, pleasure for me to welcome the special advisor of the Secretary General of the United Nations on the R2P principle, responsibility uh, to uh, uh, protect Karen Smith. Thank you so much for being uh, with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and well, good afternoon for me. Good morning for, for some of you, I believe. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me to join you um, and be part of this very distinguished panel. And uh, I really was very happy to see that you have made the issue of atrocity prevention such a central part of your agenda today. Um, and so, you know, I think I, 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 would, I would be amiss if I didn't start with, you know, looking around us today. We just heard this, that this afternoon, uh, Myanmar will be discussed at the UN again. Um, you know, despite the calls, the, the never ending calls that we hear about never again, it's clear that the Commission of Atrocity Crimes continues to stay in our collective conscience. And as we all know, atrocity prevention is a global and collective agenda in which all national and international actors have a role to play. I think there's, all, there's often this assumption, and I hear it very often in my engagements, that, you know, it's something that belongs to the UN. Uh, it's something that the UN uh, needs to sort out. Um, but I think in line with the commitment made by all UN member states in 2005 to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity, much still remains to be done in terms of integrating atrocity prevention into national government structures and policies. And maybe just with a quick reference to the responsibility to protect, we all know that the so-called first pillar of the responsibility to protect really is about the individual responsibility of states to protect their own populations. And I, so I think in that regard, again, there's much that parliaments can do um, to implement this. When it comes to national actors, we often, and again, this is something I think I see happening at the UN, we often tend to think primarily about the executive branch of government without paying due consideration to other institutions. And obviously this is a much too narrow approach. All citizens know very well that national parliaments play a key role in defining national policies and, importantly, in ensuring that political commitments are preserved and delivered on. It goes without saying that this role is central in de democratic governance, and of course the same should apply to the issue of preventing atrocities. In fact, sure. this past year we've seen a number of parliaments take the lead in ra raising issues of atrocity prevention and response, and calling on their governments to take stronger action. The now, in an attempt to think more systematically about the role of parliaments in atrocity prevention, my predecessor, the former special advisor on the responsibility to protect, Ivan Simonovic, who is actually joining us here today in his capacity as the Croatian ambassador to the UN, uh, developed an accountability guidance note for parliamentarians that contains very useful information and ideas on how to best promote atrocity prevention in the work of national parliaments. In addition, the resolution passed by the Interparliamentary Union in 2013 on the role of parliaments in implementing the responsibility to protect also contains an extensive list of ways in which parliaments can play a greater role in preventing atrocities. In this regard, there are a number of steps that parliamentarians can take. 
Some of these relate to parliamentary action on internal matters like allocation of resources, while others relate to parliamentary oversight and decision-making on issues concerned with states foreign policies. Now, in the interest of moving beyond talking about the importance of atrocity prevention in an abstract way and thinking about it in more concrete, practical terms, I want to go on to mention a few specific ways in which parliaments can contribute to atrocity prevention. Firstly, national parliaments are central to monitoring the status of ratification and implementation of core instruments of international human rights and humanitarian law. We know that atrocity crimes do not happen overnight and are preceded by human rights violations. So ensuring that the protection of human rights, including those of minorities and other vulnerable groups, is part of domestic legislation is therefore a crucial function. Relatedly, parliaments have an essential role to play in states' adoption and ratification of critical international instruments related directly to the prevention of atrocities, such as the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, or the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Moreover, it can be incumbent on parliamentarians to integrate atrocity crimes prevention in the development and adoption of relevant legislation. This can relate, for example, to legislation connected to criminal accountability and redress for past and present atrocity crimes, or to clauses in trade bills that put constraints on trading with states guilty of, of committing atrocity crimes. They can also propose and lead advocacy for the establishment of an annual parliamentary debate on atrocity crimes prevention or the establishment of parliamentary committees on this issue. As part of the oversight role, national parliaments should hold the executive arm accountable for fulfilling international commitments, um, as well as the legal obligations that may result from them, which includes that parliamentarians should continuously pose questions to members of the executive, including to heads of government and state, on actions taken to fulfill their responsibility to prevent atrocity crimes. They can, of course, also raise questions about the role of human rights institutions and ombudspersons in supporting atrocity crimes prevention and actively develop proposals for strengthening this role when needed. Importantly, national parliaments can also explore opportunities for conducting regular atrocity risk assessments and reporting on them, whether by proposing that this is undertaken by government, national human rights institutions or ombudspersons, and or by supporting civil society initiatives to reflect on national risks. This could entail the creation of national atrocity prevention strategies, including early warning systems, and could be integrated into existing reporting mechanisms, such as the Human Rights Council's universal per periodic review process. Now, with regards to specific factors that increase the risk of atrocity crimes, such as hate speech, parliaments again have great potential to speak out and act against expressions of hatred that constitute incitement to violence, and to ensure through, for example, education and awareness initiatives that the public are informed about the differences between freedom of expression and hate speech and the potential risks of the latter. I would also like to emphasize that last year's Secretary General report on R2P, the responsibility to protect, highlighted the link between gender inequality and the risks of atrocity crimes. It's therefore also incumbent on parliaments to not only ensure women's full participation in all spheres of society, but also to address gender-based discrimination and inequality as risk factors of atrocity crimes, including through criminalizing sexual violence. We know that a holistic approach to atrocity prevention will only be possible with the equal and meaningful participation of women at all levels and stages. Last but not least, national parliaments, of course, control the power of the press. This means that they can raise questions in budget debates about the allocation of resources for atrocity prevention measures, both nationally and internationally. When it comes to foreign policy, parliaments can establish contacts with parliamentarians in other countries and in regional organizations who support atrocity prevention with a view to maintaining mutually supportive networks and sharing lessons learned. They can forge relationships with parliamentarians and countries facing atrocity crime risks 
and support them through exchanges of good practices, raising discussions of atrocity crime risks and their prevention, or supporting the building of national and international networks of allies, including within civil society and the media. I'd like to end by just mentioning that my former colleague, the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Adama Dieng, periodically held engagements with parliamentary committees and subcommittees in a number of countries. My office and Mr. Dieng's success, successor, uh, Special Advisor, Alison De Ritu, who could unfortunately not join us today due to prior commitments, she's currently on mission in, in Bosnia, uh, intend to build on this legacy and hope that the interaction can be a reciprocal one. To this end, I invite parliamentarians to reach out to the office for briefings, technical support, and any other assistance, including capacity building on identifying risk factors for atrocity crimes or addressing encountering hate speech, amongst others. I very much look forward to exploring all of these opportunities with you, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um... Karen, for, for your terrific presentation in particular, for really focusing on the, on the work of parliamentarians themselves and the enormous amount uh, of uh, very important work that can be done by parliamentarians. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my, my colleague Ivan uh, Shimonovic, uh, who is in the, in the call. It's great to see Ivan. Um, Ivan has uh, done an, uh, a tremendous work on the, on the, RTP, uh, on the RTP agenda. We're now turning to our two uh, commentators, and our first commentator is uh, Kyle Matthews, Executive Director of the Montreal Institute for uh, Genocide and Human Rights uh, Studies. It's a pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, uh, distinguished guests, and for the chance to talk about the importance of the role of parliamentarian <laughs> atrocity prevention. Um, I think uh, Volker Turk was, was bang on when he talked about the intersection of the global, the global and the local. And I think that's the key role that civil society groups can engage parliamentarians to uh, do many things to support the UN in its, um, in its task to enforce the Genocide Convention and work on the response we protect. Um, there's been quite a few interesting developments in the last decade and a half, seeing parliamentarians take on a more leading role in dealing with mass atrocity crimes. We have in the Canadian Parliament, of which my colleague Romy Blair will talk about in a minute, we had the creation of the Canadian All-Party Group against the Prevention of Genocide. The British Parliament also has a similar group, and we've seen other groups break out on thematic issues, such as the Uyghurs wow. and others. So they're starting to see um, different um, groups of MPs pop up together and try to really um, hold uh, the executive branch to account and to support the UN in its work. We've also have seen civil society groups. So the PGA has played a leading role in this, but working with the Stanley Foundation, the Global Center for R2P has convened with the Hague Institute uh, parliamentarians in The Hague a few years ago to put out strategic documents and, and policy recommendations for parliamentarians to deal with this problem. Uh, we've seen the International Parliamentary Union uh, put forward resolutions on the response you protect to which all their members are supposed to work towards. And we also have recently, uh, well, recently a couple of years ago, um, the PGA, uh, my institute and the Stanley Foundation came together for the Milan Forum on preventing violent extremism uh, and, and atrocity crimes, looking at the particular role of a growth of non-state actors like ISIS, Boko Haram, and what could be done to deal with this kind of new form of, of, of extremism that leads to genocide and crime against humanity. Put out, uh, for example, a handbook for parliamentarians that's still available online, and also prepare draft legislation to actually try to prosecute returnee fighters to certain countries. So there's many things going on, but there more has to be done. I would suggest to everyone, uh, one thing I think could be done and could help everyone in this group is to look at certain models of legislation that are happening across the world. In the United States, for example, the Senate passed the Eli Weasel Act, which is a detailed um, uh, legislation that talks about, as, as uh, Karen Smith mentioned, about the power of the purse, about putting forward funding and mobilizing resources internally within the US government so they would have institutional capacity to be more efficient and more forceful. We need to see more governments and more legislatures working on this issue. We've also seen coming out of the US, the Uyghur Act, uh, uh, and as well as a forced labor act, looking at particular how to deal with supply chains where there might be um, uh, groups being targeted for atrocity crimes, how we could cut that out of our economic systems. So these are all really interesting things that need to be looked at. And, and last but not least, I'd also say there's been a, another growth of, of these called Magnitsky sanctions, where we're seeing increasing number of states of parliamentarians 
advocating for sanctions against those committing atrocity crimes, individual members in certain governments. And, and we've seen uh, uh, in the European Union, we've seen pushback by China. So this is gaining the attention. And it's, it's a new tool that might not be 100% efficient, but it's another toolbox in order to uh, make never again a reality. Um, last but not least, I would just say that uh, we've seen recently six par parliaments across the world recognize crimes uh, against Uyghurs as genocide. Um, this is a, a showing sign that parliaments are having a growing role in global affairs and upholding R2P and demanding that the Genocide Convention be acted upon. So I would just end with this. I think that parliamentarians have been underutilized, but there is a chance and a growth for us to engage them and to have a bigger impact to support the UN um, in the next 25 years, as David said, as we reach the 100th anniversary of the UN Charter. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, it is now my honor to give the floor to somebody who does actually need an introduction. That's General uh, Romeo uh, Dallaire, uh, an iconic figure for anyone who has worked in the field of international and criminal justice and genocide prevention. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you here. And the floor is yours. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. And uh, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, with the short time, uh, brevity is not necessarily the strength of uh, generals which are retired and senators that are retired, but I'll do my best uh, to keep it short. Um, around 2006 and so, Kofi Annan created the Genocide Prevention Advisory uh, Board uh, or Council uh, made up of people like Desmond Tutu, Garth Evans, myself, uh, David Hamburg, uh, uh, and we had the uh, representatives just like uh, Ed Luck and so on who were there. And we had come to a position where on the one hand, we were looking at how uh, the UN could collate all the magnificent information it had from all its agencies and, and departments on countries in a predictive manner to prevent uh, these catastrophes from happening. Uh, and that didn't go very well, didn't go very far because there is not a sense of openness or transparency between the departments or the agencies of the UN. And so there's a massive amount of detailed information that could be extraordinarily useful in prevention. So that's from the institutional side of the house. But uh, what did come out, however, uh, that we were pushing was is that we in a prevention mode uh, could go into countries with a very small UN flag and try to advise countries as to uh, scenarios that would degenerate to uh, situations like we saw with Darfur and so on, uh, which would align them with the realization that we're watching this and that they could, in fact, uh, do actions that would prevent that. That was, was not well received because there was a fear of the, the flag being there. And so when I became a senator, I created the Genocide Prevention Group to, um, to be very humble, to educate, to inform all parties, all parliamentarians, both houses uh, of the scenarios of human rights abuses around the world and that it was no more local, it, we were all now part of a nearly uh, uh, a globe without borders, as in fact the young people see it, the millenniums call it a generation without borders. And so from there, uh, and in looking at that, it is to me, there is a possibility of creating something practical where parliamentarians are underused, underused to hold the executives accountable underused to influence their committees, underused to influence everything from budgets to foreign policy to everything else, uh, and underused to engage amongst themselves. And so we created an MOU with the UK uh, similar organization because we felt that if we created uh, uh, points, uh, focal points around the world of parliamentarians, we could, in fact, uh, build a momentum that could be deployed. What I'm saying by that is, is that the parliamentarians, by bringing these focal points, 
of parliamentarians and mass atrocities, massive abuses of human rights, uh, creating a synergy amongst themselves that would bring influence on the institutions by also deploying two countries to go and influence as parliamentarians to other parliamentarians that they have enormous potential that they could influence by not necessarily being in the executive, but by influencing the processes to that. And so ladies and gentlemen, I believe strongly that we can and should move towards trying to build these genocide prevention groups, these uh, mass atrocity focal points in all the parliaments of democracies that are out there, that we do coalesce these focal points and that we do with the PGA support, uh, do bring together uh, parliamentarians who can, in fact, low key, but with influence and credibility, go and prevent in countries things going catastrophic by engaging with the parliamentarians in those countries. And yeah, there are some risks, I agree. But the advantage, the potential that parliamentarians have of influencing the world is underrated, underused, underscored, and in fact is a real wastage of enormous political power. And so I hope that we can move towards uh, coalescing all these focal points and creating these capabilities of not only educating our own, but using some of us to be able to, in fact, influence things uh, there without necessarily having to use the UN flag, but using the parliamentary flag as parliamentarians in democracies. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's go into our Q&A immediately. Who wants to start? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Christian, for hosting us today. Uh, my name is Antonio Nikis, uh, Member of Parliament from Mozambique, and I chair the Planning and Budget Committee, and I'm PGA Executive Committee Member. Uh, well, I would like to start uh, uh, by congratulating uh, Mr. Duterte for his election, which is a clear demonstration and the recognition of a, a fantastic contribution for the humankind and uh, the job he's doing towards an uh, effectiveness UN uh, that is more driven and relevant to all the people. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Karen, uh, uh, the special advisor to the UN has elaborated in deeply in several dimensions of patrocity and uh, crimes related uh, to uh, what is uh, in terms of concept uh, uh, still uh, uh, going on in several parts. But I would like to bring another dimension of uh, atrocities, which is much linked with what is happening in uh, Africa, particularly in uh, extractive industry, whereby we have uh, countries with uh, so many uh, rich mineral resources, oil and gas, but uh, which are unable to exploit for the benefit of the communities. And this sort of uh, resources has become a nightmare instead of a blessing. And we have uh, so many people who are displaced. We have uh, issues of human rights abuse. And I think this is one of the topics that uh, in this uh, coming uh, mandate of the Secretary General of the UN should be brought in, into attention. It's clear that PGA has done a tremendous efforts in terms of uh, several different campaigns, uh, engaging parliamentarians to fast track the SDG agenda. We can name some few, like uh, currently there is one on uh, oceans, 
which aims to ensure that uh, there is security because you know most of the countries who have a huge coastline they are being affected by uh, pirates and some terrorist groups who, who can um, in somehow with the atrocities that they carry on uh, does not allow uh, the, the countries with limited resources in terms of security to exploit the natural resources. So I think this uh, should be part of our global agenda to see how those countries who are, have limited means uh, can be also uh, assisted to ensure that uh, the uh, blessing from uh, mineral resources, mainly the, from the extractive industry, uh, can be exploited in a way that can does not generate atrocities or does not generate uh, violation of human rights. So, my proposal is uh, to make sure that with these discussions. Uh, countries which have experimented this kind of situations like in Nigeria, where the DRC with the so-called blood diamonds, now the case of Mozambique with the oil and gas offshore could be a part of the attention for the common agenda in terms of uh, global security and uh, SDGs uh, implementation, which in, in, entails all those issues and tackle uh, the problem of security in those particular areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I would like really to probably try to join two of the main points raised by uh, the special uh, representative for responsibility to protect and General uh, Dallaire. I think that PGA has worked many years on atrocity prevention by trying to establish legal frameworks against impunity. So those who can think about committing them, they can think about of paying a cost, paying a price if they would undergo that route. We've been successful in some regions, less in others. And when I remember, I will never forget, the parliament of Yemen in 2013 in June was about to ratify their own statute, but some ill uh, advice came from the European Union and other partners, and they decided to postpone because it was said not to be a legitimate parliament. It was a lawful parliament. Well, what happened in Yemen, we know. Uh, there was a coup d'etat, there was a Saudi-led coalition that led to a massive victimization, a civil war that is ongoing. The UN, uh, Mr. Guterres called it two years ago the, the largest humanitarian disaster in the world. Uh, so I think there is uh, something to be done there, as Karen Smith said, to continue and redouble our work on domestic implementation and ratification of treaties. She mentioned the Rome Statute, there are other treaties. But I also think that what General Dallaire su suggested here is very useful, which is to create a network of focal points and we don't need to duplicate what has been done already in Canada. And I think our board member, Ali Esas, is with us. He took the torch from, um, from General Dallaire, he's now the, the, the chair of that all party group, uh, I, Ali. And, and we don't need to uh, overlap with the UK or party group that already exists, but simply create a system of cooperation. And I think uh, there is a major um, missing link there because many states, the, the legislation that Kyle mentioned, the El Wiesel Act of the United States, it's a good act. They also have Uyghur genocide as a political recognition, but they don't have crimes against humanity. And they also, are debating, only, only PJ member uh, Jim McGovern is advocating for them to join the ICC. The, the overwhelming opinion is really very much prejudiced, Steve, even though now with the Biden administration, they came to a, a very good cooperation as they also said at, on the 3rd of July of June, sorry, at the OAS meeting that uh, Tucapel Jimenez, our member from Chile who is with us, addressed. So they, they made a very, without reservation, uh, declaration of full cooperation and collaboration with, with the court. Uh, at the level of the United States delegation to the OAS. So what I would say is that we could become more operational on this idea. I think that atrocity prevention can be also an angle to deal with also the delivery of weapons to these groups. And my final point to uh, comment on what maybe 
uh, Antonio said, and uh, what I would call upon a reaction from um, uh, uh, Special Representative Carrie Smith, is that are we doing enough to know who is funding, training, equipping, and arming those groups? Now they emerged in northern uh, Mozambique. There is now a new group affiliated with ISIS. How did they come about? What about all these groups in the Sahel region of North Africa? What is being done to understand where is the money coming from? Because it's coming from somewhere. So it's something more needs to be done. And certainly if I can say something as a, a human rights activist and not as the PJ Secretary General, there is Saudi Arabia that is now going uh, probably to be elected in the Human Rights Council, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, uh, maybe the, the link is there, maybe not, but I think something more needs to be done to understand who is behind these groups that are uh, then contributing to the uh, looting uh, of the mineral and other resources of, of uh, certainly African countries, but also in, in other regions of the world. Thank you, David. We have a request for the floor. Yes, please, just uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak, please. Can I go ahead if it's fine? Uh, and just, just to mention, Saudi Arabia was also already elected in the Women's Rights Commission, which is quite crazy, yeah? but another topic. Um, I'm really very honored and delighted to have such uh, great experts with us today on this topic, um, which is very close to my heart. Um, inspired by my work, um, I, I'm Petra Bayer from Austria. Um, I inspired by my work um, of, in, in, at PGA, in my quite rare spare time, I try to write a dissertation and make my PhD in developing a prevention mechanism for genocide and ethnic cleansing on a scientific level. It's not a political question that I will raise now. Um, and I think all of you mentioned that the genocide uh, convention even has the prevention in the title. Of the, of the convention, but it rarely was ever applied. I think um, there was one no-fly uh, no zone also uh, related to R2P uh, mechanisms that could maybe have uh, prevented the genocide in Syria, maybe, um, but we have little evidence of um, prevented genocides or ethnic cleansings. So I, I would like to ask you, and especially reading the memoirs of, of um, Ms. Mr. Delaire, um, and, and I focus on two issues, on, 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 on two cases on Rwanda and on Srebrenica, and both cases show very clear that there was a lot of evidence, a lot of knowledge, but all the multilateral bodies tried to avoid the G-word, because it was clear if they say, yes, there is a genocide under or, or ongoing. Daniel, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, mute yourself? No, Daniel, Gerson, please, could you mute? No, Thank you. But there's still somebody else there. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so my question is simple. What could be a kind of early warning indicator for genocides where you can produce evidence on the, on the ground, on the field, and where you can really force multilateral um, uh, bodies, be it the Security Council, be it the NATO or whoever, um, really to act and to prevent and to, and to, to use R2P, for instance, as, a, as an emerging uh, international norm, yeah? uh, to really be active. So that um, would help me maybe to speed up my PhD. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Petra. That would be a good cause. Uh, floor is open. Um, who else would like to speak? Uh, yes, please. Um, thank you, Excellency. Uh, I do have one or two points to raise. Um, uh, in this news that says UN proposal seeks arms embargo and democracy in Myanmar, uh, with one part of it mentioning to prevent the flow of arms into Myanmar. So this is a preventive mechanism uh, that would ideally should not lead to crimes against humanity, genocide, ethnic cleansing. But the devil is in the details. Um, I want to uh, quote what um, uh, Karen Smith mentioned on clauses on trade bills and linking that to whether that can be brought in as a preventive measure. You can say, you know, till the cows come home, 
that we want to prevent the flow of arms into Myanmar, but how do you actually do that on paper? If a country decides to, to sell for whatever reason arms into Myanmar because of their long-standing relationship, whether it's China or other countries, uh, and with the involvement of oil companies as well, uh, not just uh, political entities, but with this kind of big mega cash cows, uh, it is a concern in the ASEAN region, for, for particularly for me, coming from Malaysia. Uh, we are state players uh, in ASEAN, uh, but uh, the, the recent meetings between the executive parties at the ASEAN meetings actually was just an eyewash, I think. Uh, nothing constructive came out of it. Uh, obviously, the rightfully elected uh, representatives uh, of the Parliament of Myanmar are disappointed because all hopes were on this ASEAN meeting between foreign ministers and between whether presidents are talking about it or prime ministers, uh, which brings me back to this uh, question of uh, trade bills. How do we, how do we go about um, uh, ensuring that there is something more rigid in place, something more robust, something more uh, constructive to really get these countries that are guilty of providing uh, arms and selling, uh, uh, you know, whether it's biological or chemical, like Mr. Navid pointed out, uh, you know, so that we actually can live up to that word of preventing genocide or crimes against humanity and aggression as well, which I think many times we forget to mention the word aggression. It is not just that wider uh, view of ethnic cleansing, genocide or crimes against humanity, but aggression uh, in its own right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I just say you touched on so many points that are very important <laughs> to me, <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, the provision that he that he that he quoted essentially from the resolution that we will adopt this afternoon has a very 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 long history. Mm. Um, so we've talked about this for many uh, many weeks. I, I essentially I, I strongly agree with you. It would be wonderful to have a separate conversation um, with you um, on this. And uh, now we seem to have a. Bit of a technical issue here, no, or are we are, okay? No, I think we are we're okay. Um, and also, of course, on the topic of aggression, uh, I, I very, very much uh, strongly agree with you. So many thanks for your comments. Um, the floor is uh, open uh, to others. We don't see you on the big screen right now, but uh, Excellency. Yes, please. And uh, I think then, in response to uh, the previous speaker, th there is one area of early warning that can rally people around the table and ultimately be an extraordinary preventive tool. And that is recognizing the use of child soldiers, the use of children as weapons of war. If any either nation or non-state actor is prepared to use children to conduct the exactations that they are doing, and build their force and mobilize their capabilities based on the backs of children uh, under 18s, then that organization, that country is prepared to go to the extreme of ultimately going to mass atrocities and even genocide. And we saw it on both sides in, in Rwanda, uh, the, that recruitment. And so I think that the, an early warning tool that can be pushed and exercised, and we've been doing over 10 years of work and study at my institute in Dalhousie University, proves that they are the first sign of mass use of children being employed to conduct mass atrocities. And so I think that is a rallying point that certainly parliamentarians could easily uh, build around. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Floor is open. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, next week. okay. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah the mic there. Yes, absolutely. I just want to say something about what the general just said about the childs in military forces. You can say that you we can speak we can be speaking about some country in Africa but in Honduras my country two hours and a flight two hours from Miami five hours from New York City there's a program instituted by the actual government called Guardianes de la Patria and Nation Guards that took poor kids from poor cities or or poor sides of one city 
and give them arms in the military force. And they are saying that the government is educating this, this poor kid that has no chance in life and give him a purpose, a purpose in life. That is happening right now in Honduras, yes. a country in Central America. It's not a country in Africa. Just, I, I wanted to, to say that because the general just uh, took this, this point in, in to the discussion and, and it's very important for me that you to know all, all, you, all of you that it, this is happening in my country. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for flagging this. I was actually not not aware, and I'm I'm, in, I'm sure many. You can look look at yeah, mine. No, Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Excellency, I I was in the favelas in Brazil also, where children are used in the in drug wars extensively, and they're just like child soldiers. And so I'm opening up a center of excellence, in fact, in Uruguay, uh, to help the security forces on how to prevent the recruitment of children. Uh, is, um, as uh, weapons of war. And so uh, Central America is very much part of our Latin America look. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else? We, we're now more in keeping with UN standards again and we're behind the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you give me 20 seconds, yes. I just want to put here on the table uh, to support Jorge's view. We have a new member who joined from Afghanistan, Honorable Ma Mariam Suleimani, and she said that she cannot really accept the Taliban as a peace uh, party to any peace deal for Afghanistan if they continue to take children for, from poor family, send them into sort of education centers. Yep. And unfortunately, Navid, we were told that some of those are in the, within the borders of Pakistan. That's what, that's what Honorable Mariam told us. And that these can create the new way for the Taliban to regain power because they are able to brainwash, to, to, bra to, 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 to manipulate and enslave children, which is a crime against humanity. Both the Honduras and, and, and Afghanistan are state parties to the SEC. Enslavement of children is a crime against humanity. They cannot give pre-consent to be part of military, paramilitary, or any types of group like that. So if this policy is true, um, Horgan, and, and I have no doubt, it could also be configured as, as, as a crime against humanity of those who are masterminding and implementing it. So let, let's work on this, okay. because it's a very serious yeah. issue, and, and we don't need to look at the Taliban only. There, there may be other realities, but it, it's, it's a major impediment also for peace. Think sure. about the long-term uh, situation in Afghanistan, for example. So. May I very egoistically ask whether I could follow up bilaterally with our three panelists on this issue? Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anybody this, else? This oh, recruitment. Oh, sorry. Otherwise, yeah. we would uh, yeah. move to our. Oh, I think uh, Rodrigo, you want to speak, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and, and uh, thanks for convening uh, this meeting. Hello to David. Uh, always uh, nice uh, to see you. We've seen each other through the screens in the last uh, 20 months or so, but uh, we are always on the same uh, tune and the same uh, looking for uh, after the same serious uh, issues such as the ones that we've been discussing now. Never again, never again is uh, something that has been set for many decades uh, in the world. And, uh, uh, and, and yet this afternoon, we're still trying to push a, a very important resolution uh, on the Myanmar issue that has been strongly, very, very strongly worked by Ambassador Ben Abbasir together with the our deputy uh, representative, uh, Ms. Uh, Ambassador Chan of Costa Rica, and the large uh, core group, and uh, so that that uh, the atrocities that have happened in other parts of the world do not occur in uh, in Myanmar in the months and years to come. Uh, I, I've had the. Uh, it was what a complete experience in uh, these subjects, according to what has 
been mentioned, being, having been blessed of, uh, by being the first ombudsman of uh, Costa Rica, uh, where we have a very striking name for that position. We call it Defensor del Pueblo, Defensor de los Habitantes, Defender of uh, the People. And uh, I should have began say, appreciating Karen Smith's uh, introduction to the subject in which uh, she uh, was uh, worked uh, at the UN uh, together with, with a group of responsibility to protect in order to find ways out of uh, this atrocity crimes uh, through a uh, prevention. She mentioned uh, the institution of the ombudsman. And, and as a former ombudsman and also former legislator in uh, Costa Rica and now involved in the responsibility to protect the group here at the United Nations. I have to say that I was a very, very highly stricken by what uh, Diputado Calix has just mentioned about what is going on in Honduras. Very, very, very stricken. It's, uh, we, I, I remember when we first started these movements of ombudspersons in, in Latin America, how uh, Jorge, we went to Honduras uh, to protect the life of uh, the then ombudsperson, Leo Valladares, who was precisely calling for end of uh, many of the circumstances in the country. And uh, we should put up the motto, if you want peace, prepare for peace. I mean, let's, let's be careful of not having children, as the Neron was also mentioning, not having children uh, being prepared for, for war. So uh, I think that uh, the appreciation for this uh, commentaries and uh, bringing this subject is a high appreciation. Uh, rounding my, my formation on this is the fact of uh, being here at the United Nations, uh, working uh, side by side with Ambassador Benabasir, with uh, many other colleagues, with uh, Karen Smith, and learning, I must say, learning uh, from uh, my colleague Ivan, uh, Ivan uh, Simonovic, I have to check on his uh, last name, Ivan uh, Sivonovich, who has been a, a professor, a teacher on the issue of the responsibility to protect and the, the atrocity uh, prevention. And, and thanks very much for this uh, very interesting uh, conversation this morning. To all Thank of you. Thank you for being with us. And I now have to... Uh and my apologies to all of you because I have to leave, but you know, it's, it is for a good cause. So it's uh, the last meeting we have uh, before the vote on the on the Myanmar resolution this, this afternoon. We have indications that the, the vote uh, may pass actually without the vote. So that would be, it would be uh, good, of course, but we have no guarantees yet. Um, uh, thank you, David, and, and thank you all for being here. I, I wish I could have lunch with you, honestly. Um, uh, we would You're still invited. If you can make it to the El Pote oh, Español, okay. you have okay. one hour and a half okay. to join us because okay. it's going to be a long Mediterranean lunch. Okay, okay, that's one and a half, two hours. It could be a nice stop on the way okay. to the UN. Very good. And uh, so wonderful to to have you all here, and thank you all for joining uh, virtually. Um, special greetings to Margareta Sederfeld, who will speak at the at the end. Who's a who's an old friend. Uh, it's wonderful to to know that you're, you're still so active for PGA. So thank you all very much. Thank and uh, good luck for the rest thank of your you conversation. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, so the much. Um, thank you Ambassador. Please. We have only well, one uh, speaker great. left. So before mm -hmm. to move out of the responsibility to protect the uh, agenda, if there is any uh, other comments from our fantastic panelists, I think uh, General Dallero already spoke. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Karen. We'll be remaining in touch and intensifying cooperation with you and with uh, Miss Nderitu, of course, who's your colleague in charge of atrocity prevention. The last segment that we have is strengthening international law and international criminal justice. And we only have one speaker. 
the last but not the least, uh, she's representing uh, the European Union, Ms. Simona Popan, head of the legal section here at the permanent mission, and both the permanent representative and the DPR, uh, both ambassadors are members of our UN committee. It's, it's a fantastic honor for PGA. And uh, even yesterday with uh, um, Kashturi Pato, we were together in a European Parliament meeting. So we work really on a weekly basis uh, with Brussels. So uh, Simona, we really look forward to your input. Uh, thank you very much for, for this kind of invitation and uh, apologies on behalf of my uh, uh, PR and uh, deputy PR for not being able to be here today. Um, yeah, so now coming back to, to the topic, um, the topic strengthening international and uh, international law and international criminal justice is a very rich uh, terrain for, for conversations. And um, I think I will just, you know, flag up a couple of thoughts on my, on my side. To start with, uh, international law is uh, the backbone of the multilateral system. Uh, international law, in my view, uh, works best when it reflects aims and values ingrained in long-standing social practices, when it formalizes social norms, rather than when it comes to impose or change them. Uh, the UN, in that regard, is the place to formalize uh, such norms. It is the place where international law meets multilateralism and they blend together in what we call multilateral rules-based order that the EU so much supports. Uh, we know that international law is both constraining and permissive, but international law alone cannot deliver justice by itself. It needs to uh, the support uh, of international community the support of uh, national judiciary and the support of national legislators in particular in order to translate the set of norms into national legislation or to encourage the development of new norms. Another point I would like to make is that international law can also not deliver enforcement by itself. It is not because atrocity crimes uh, are outlawed that they will not happen. Although we know that uh, criminalization by itself has a, a dissuasive uh, effect. For that to happen, efforts are needed so that states submit their actions to international courts and tribunals, that they abide by their rulings, and that investigation mechanism and criminal courts can deliver on their mandates without external pressure or uh, interference. And there, I cannot stress more the role of the legislators in that regard. They have a role, uh, as has been said by previous speakers, uh, to advocate for the prevention of human rights abuses and to call for accountability when such abuses happen. National legislators have a tremendous contribution to the promotion of the rule of law at both national and international level by promoting accountability and the fight against impunity, which is really key to delivering justice for victims. Parliaments are also instrumental in supporting international courts to deliver on their mandates. The European Parliament, for instance, play a key role in relations to, uh, to the ICC, which is the words, uh, words first and only permanent international criminal court, and is very often seen as the last hope for uh, victims of horrendous crimes. The European Parliament uh, provided political impetus through uh, resolutions in support of international criminal justice and supported the court through the proactivity of the informal groups of uh, MEPs, uh, friends of ICC, oh, no, no. promote accountability in EU policy. The Parliament, like other institutions, uh, show tremendous support to protect the court from external interference and to preserve its integrity and stood up against attempts to discredit the court, uh, to discredit the court and to obstruct its work. And the final word on my side uh, regarding uh, the subject matter of discussion today. 
On the occasion of the uh, 75th anniversary of the UN, the leaders agreed to abide by international law and to ensure justice. I can only hope that that commitment will translate into concrete action and that the pandemic will not be invoked as a justification to depart from international law and from the rule of law in general. It is in our view actually in crisis time that the rule of law is most needed as it helps to protect people from the rule of the powerful. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simona. And uh, we are really delighted that uh, you brought in a, a very thorough perspective. You mentioned the groups of the Friends of the ICC in the European Parliament. Um, it might not be a surprise for everyone to know that this is overlapping with the PGA European Parliament group chaired by the Vice President in charge of uh, 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 Human Rights and Democracy, Mr. Mr. Castaldo. So, um, if there is any comment or question, I was uh, the next to comment, but I really would defer to the honorable members. If you have any questions for the European Union uh, representative, uh, Antonio. Thank you uh, very much for your very brief and very uh, detailed uh, uh, speech or uh, comments or remarks. Uh, well, I would just like to figure out from your understanding what is really missing in terms of accountability from the government. We get, we get at so many different international treaties and conventions that are not being ratified and consequently are not being uh, um, effective in terms of uh, domestication in the internal laws uh, towards this effectiveness of uh, international, international law in terms of enforcement for uh, cases like uh, violations of human rights or atrocities and how can we put in place uh, mechanisms that brings the government to accountability when it comes to uh, ratification of those international treaties and conventions uh, so that we can go beyond the, the excuses of uh, sovereignty and other kind of uh, uh, challenges that we have been facing to make sure that uh, uh, what has been uh, signed or committed the international uh, environment uh, is really in practices locally. I would like you to elaborate from your experience a little bit more on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Are there any other comments or, or questions from our members, from our experts? Well, if I am allowed to say one thing, uh, Simona, is that uh, PGA has had a very long-standing partnership with the EU and especially the European Commission. So um, on behalf of PGA, uh, we are very attentive to the fact that in the new, uh, we, we welcome the new European Union budget on uh, foreign affairs, the NDICI, and noted that in the press release that the EU issued on Monday, uh, human rights and democracy is identified as third thema first th thematic priority. So um, I just wanted to somehow uh, um, uh, hope that for this uh, new budget, also there will be possibilities for global civil society organizations to be partners of the EU as it was in the past. And uh, if we can have a, a dialogue with your permanent mission in this respect, and on the merits of where the EU has made an enormous difference. Let me just end the, the, note, the, 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 the debate with a very positive note. Let's look at what happened with Sudan. In Sudan, within the framework, what is unique of the EU uh, parliamentary framework, it, the only North-South parliamentary assembly, it's called the Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, European Union Joint Parliamentary Assembly which implements the Cotonou, the revised Cotonou Agreement. And when the crimes occurred in Darfur, one of the first things that was done 
was to suspend Sudan as a member. Sudan stopped to be one of the biggest beneficiaries of certain uh, budgetary support from the EU, while of course humanitarian aid and help for the civilian population continued and support for the NGOs. At the same time, of course, the ICC had issued an arrest warrant against the president of the Sudan. Well, today, after two years of transition, Sudan is ready uh, to uh, join the international community, rejoin the revised Cotonou Agreement, reinstate all the cooperation with the EU, the AU, and all the uh, partners. So that issues that also Kasturi raised before, the issue of trade conditionalities or, or the cooperation in which also the economic cooperation is, is uh, submitted to human rights clauses yes. has been made possible, made effective through this uh, framework, which is a multilateral one between the EU, the African, Caribbean, and Pacific uh, states. So I just wanted to end the meeting with that positive note that in some cases, at least in one very important one, uh, international law has worked. It took its time, but we see uh, an horizon of hope for the people of, of the Sudan. Uh, Simona, would you like to comment? Yeah, just to react, uh, sure. Um, I think there is a lot on the ta table and it's not so much that is missing, it's what we need is to implement it. Uh, and um, I would just, you know, recall what the president of the International Residual Mechanism uh, for Criminal Tribunals like uh, two weeks ago in the debate uh, in the Security Council, he called for cooperation by states. And without cooperation by states, uh, you know, international criminal law cannot be implemented. And I think that is the, the part that is really missing. And uh, we had, have heard that also from the prosecutor uh, of the ICC, we need states to cooperate uh, with the ICC to surrender um, uh, criminals and uh, to surrender um, uh, the accused and uh, uh, the prosecutor to, to the court. So, I would insist very much on cooperation and not so much on uh, creating new mechanism, uh, although some of them they are uh, probably needed, but to implement and it's a matter of will, I would say. But if, if I may, one maybe a piece of uh, legislation which is um, missing um, for now is the, a, a Convention on Crimes Against Humanity. And uh, we have three main atrocity crimes, and this is the, uh, the one which is not covered. We have uh, draft articles by the ILC, International Law Commission, uh, which are, uh, were sent to uh, the GA. Uh, they are currently uh, being presented you know, in front of the sixth committee of the General Assembly, which is the legal committee. But um, for the last two years we are in a deadlock there so uh, we need to um, to advance on that file and I think it's a very very important file it doesn't mean that crimes against humanity cannot be prosecuted so parts of um, a lot of these you know articles uh, it's just codification of um, customary law and um, it can already be implemented. So again, this reinforces the idea that we need willingness to enforce international law and to make it work. And then uh, we, we can take it a bit further to develop and expand and uh, yeah, but that is the next level. Thank you very much. I hope this replies uh, the question. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Simona. We are perfectly on time, uh, just one minute before our end. Regretfully, our president, Margareta Sederfeld, could not join us. I, I'm just rechecking again um, if she had the ability to join us. Well, uh, she's uh, apologizing because she has been given this uh, uh, responsibility that she could not uh, refuse, which is to add the OSC Parliamentary Assembly and also the overall OSC election monitoring mission to Armenia. As you know, Armenia is a country that recently was defeated in an international armed conflict against Azerbaijan. There is a very, very serious crisis domestically, uh, also in terms of human rights and civil liberties. 
and it's probably the most delicate election in post-communist Armenia since the disintegration of the Soviet Union. So I think uh, Margareta has been given a, a very, very important task and uh, it's really a little bit of a fox majeure for her not to be able to be with us. Um, I look forward to the continuation of the board meeting tomorrow. Uh, Navid, we will uh, start meeting at 8 a.m. Uh, with all the here in New York and all around the world uh, for our uh, regular board meeting. In the meantime, I want really to thank on behalf of uh, our president, the experts, the ambassadors, and the representatives of UN institutions, because this uh, advisory committee for PGA at the UN is really an important asset for us. And the last word goes, of course, to those who organize this, because without the work of Melissa, who coordinated the, the entire project and all our interpreters, which are program officers, senior officers, a director, this could have not also been uh, organized and the entire PGA team uh, in New York and The Hague. So thank you so much. And um, it was really, we have a, a, a lot of action points to be implemented. So the next will be a follow-up message from us as usual. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Goodbye. Thank you, Karen. Bye. Thank you very much.